All right, our next presentation is What's for Sale? Discover the Power of Koha's Point of Sale System. Barbara, Barbara Rudd, Glasford Johnson, and Mary Woodward. Hello. Uh, we are going to talk about What's for Sale? Discovering the Power of the Koha POS System. And I'm Mary Woodward, um, but you can just call me Woodward Circulation Supervisor. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently I'm now Barbara Glassford Johnson, Library Manager Mary. <laughs> and we're from Bedford Public Library, Texas, um, just up 35 in North Central Texas. All right. So what is point of sale? In general terms, it's a way of tracking sales. And for our purposes, it's a way of selling items not connected to a patron account. And things can be sold like used books, tote bags. Um, in our library, we even sell pumpkins. Um, yes, we do, actually. <laughs> and um, if desired, you can um, integrate this with a patron-connected account. And, of course, this is our normal stuff like lost, damage, lost items, damaged items, things of that nature. Does anybody use the um, POS system right now? Is anybody planning to? We're going to go over um, just a few things, why we chose the Koha POS system. Um, we're going to talk about setup and configuration. Uh, we're going to we're going to show how to use it and um, go over some reports, some customizations, and um, issues, bugs, wish lists, things of that nature. So we, didn't, we missed a slide. There we go. That was the slide I was supposed to be talking about. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll go forward. So just a little bit about our library. Um, we are located in the DFW Metroplex. We are right smack in the middle between Dallas and Fort Worth. And we're open seven days a week. We are a single branch location. And um, we have over 200,000 visits a year. And we have a library staff of 20.85 FTE. Our information desk, we actually have two desks at our library. We have a youth desk and they handle programs and um, youth programming. And then we have our main information desk. And um, it's normally staffed by two staff members every hour we, we switch and almost everybody on our staff circulates through the information desk. So everybody has to know how to use the POS. And we do take payments for three different entities, the library, our friends, and our foundation. And I was just curious, does anybody else take money for their different entities? Yes, okay. I was kind of hoping you'd say no because I was <laughs> so, um, oh, no. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, at our desk, we sell office supplies. Um, our friends provide some office supplies and we sell them to the public. Um, like I said, we sell pumpkins, special event tickets. Um, we take payments for normal things like, you know, copying, faxing, things of that nature. So we had to find something that would work for everything. And um, I'm going to show you what wasn't working, but um, this is a, our cash register that we were using, and um, it's a beautiful piece of machinery. It's from 2009, and um, I actually really never thought much about this cash register. I've been working at the library since 2009, and I was in the youth department, and um, I knew how to use the register, but I certainly didn't care about the register and I didn't really want to program the register. So, um, you know, it was just there. Well, in 2018, we had a, um, got 10 or 15 people, maybe I guess 10 people retired and I was promoted to circulation supervisor. And um, in that capacity, I was in charge of the register. And so now I actually had to learn how to use and program and all the different things that went into this um, cutting edge technology. <laughs> so it was a bit of a challenge. And what I found pretty quickly is most of the people that left knew all about the register and the people that were left didn't. And that was me. Um, so <laughs> when you don't know what you're doing, at least when I don't know what I'm doing, I call IT. So we called IT 
And they didn't know what to do either because it was less than, the, the technology was um, not as advanced as they were, I guess. And so we called the vendor that we purchased the register from. And there was this long pause followed by belly laughs. <laughs> and just, I mean, really laughing. And after you know a couple of minutes and Curtis, our IT guy's looking at me and I'm like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> And the guy goes, you guys are still using that register? I'm like, yeah, we are. We're still using that register. It was a big of a problem. I was like, oh, geez. So anyway, um, I was stuck. So we had other challenges with the register. And, and I will tell you that we actually kept using this register for, well, until 2023. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we don't like to throw away things. But anyway, uh, we did. We had one shared register. And... Um, I did figure out how to print out a transaction log. And the thing about this transaction log was if you made a mistake on the 29th of the month, you had to get all of the mistakes or all of the transactions from the 1st to the 29th of the month. You, you couldn't do a date range. So if you made a mistake on the 29th, I'm going to get 200 yards worth of transactions and I have to go through them. And there was no way to fix that. Um, the other thing that happened was um, we had a credit card terminal attached to a register that was behind the front desk. And if you needed to use a debit card, you had to have the patrons come behind the desk and put their pin in. Well, I think in a former life, I was a gunslinger because <laughs> having somebody come behind the register and put in a pin and having the drawer pop open really made me nervous. I'm funny that way. So anyway, our register was on its deathbed. So we were looking for some solutions. And I'm losing my voice. So the first thing we did, the first thing we did is we um, investigated an integrated solution. And I was really excited about this because the whole idea of um, taking a, you know, a, a invoice off of a patron's account and having it, you know, keep track of that. I was very excited about that. But, um, and it was going to be easy to use. But what we found pretty quickly is it was pretty expensive. And it was really hard to justify the amount of money that it was for the amount of money that we were actually taking in. So, um, and then we had some problems with Verifone. And um, Verifone was very, very unresponsive. And we had been using this vendor for our print management system. And I had some concerns about their customer service. So it didn't seem like a good idea to give them new business. So we um, quickly decided not to go that route. But our finance department came to the rescue and they offered their software, which they use for accounting and check, um, check requests and things like that. Um, and then it was great, but it really wasn't set for um, a busy service desk. And in fact, in order to take a transaction, there were 12 steps. <laughs> this seemed a little bit absurd for a 40 cent transaction. <laughs> but the part that really upset me and made my staff look at me like they were going to chase me around with a pitchfork was the fact that in all these 12 steps, it wasn't going to tell you how much change to change to make. So that was really a big no. And um, the other thing was that we would have to log in and log out every hour. And it still wasn't going to be integrated with Koha. So that was an out. But Koha came to the rescue. <laughs> And um, it was great because it was free and it was supported by the Koha community and by water and it was uh, customizable and our staff already knew how to use it. There was a couple things that were a bit of a downer and that was that it wasn't integrated with our credit card terminal and it didn't have all the details for reporting that we needed. Now the wizard. <laughs> So I'm going to show you the setup and configuration, which is super easy. 
there are two system preferences you need to set up in order to enable POS. The first one is called enable point of sale and you set that to enable. The second one you need is use cash registers and you're gonna set that to use. That's gonna enable the POS in Koha. There's a system preference in the middle there called require cash register. Um, you may already have that set up for payments you take on the um, patron account side. We have ours set to always require a cash register. And I think the other setting is only required when you're actually taking cash. So once you've done those system preferences, you now have enabled point of sale and it is the top button uh, on the right hand side of your home screen. Uh, we enabled it first in our test server and we ended up setting up cash registers. I'm gonna show that in a minute. Uh, we set up cash registers for each, each of our CERC staff so that they could start to get comfortable with it. They could make sales, um, you know, find problems, things they didn't understand. And also doing it on the test server meant that uh, we weren't creating all this fake data on the production side. So we felt pretty comfortable just doing whatever we needed to do in the test server to start learning this. So the first thing you need to do once you've got uh, it set up is you have to go in and configure a cash register. Um, so it's pretty similar to a lot of different things you set up in Koha. You go in, uh, in POS, you find that confirmed cash registers link. It'll bring up uh, a page where you're gonna give your register a name. Uh, description, ours is really creative because it's exactly the same thing for both of those. <laughs> Uh, we are one library, so we just have, uh, you know, just Bedford for that, but you can set it up for multiple different um, libraries. And then you need to decide on the initial float, and that's going to be the amount of money you're always leaving in your cash drawer so that you can make change. And um, you would save that and set up more registers if you need to. We originally thought we would have um, more than one register set up. So that's why this one is called Info Register 1. In the end, we're just using one register. If you're thinking of setting this up and you're going to have lots of different registers, I would um, consider maybe thinking about a naming scheme so that you, um, you know, you can be very specific about where these registers are. It could come into reporting or sorting something. So you might wanna think about how you wanna name your different registers. Um, this is optional, but you can set a default register, which we chose to do. Um, and so this just shows, the top one shows a register that exists, but it's not the default. And then the bottom one, uh, the staff register, you can see where it says library default is yes. So that one is set up as our default. Um, every time we log in, that register is selected. And another good thing about it is whenever you need to look at the transaction history for all of the things that have happened, uh, you have to be logged in to a register. So this just, the red, we're logged in by default and it's set. So now you have a register and now you need to start configuring items for purchase. You may already have some things configured in your system. We did. Um, and they were very, um, you know, just copies, facts, you know, just those kinds of things. Um, at this time, our finance department kind of, I think, revamped our list of codes and stuff. So we took their codes and um, incorporated them into the, the names and the codes we have in Koha. So we completely replaced all of our um, debit types, which is what these are. It's, when you set it up, it's called configure items for purchase, but they're known as debit types. So um, setting one of those up, uh, you will go to the screen similar, you've got put in a code. Um, you can choose to add a default amount or not. So you may have things like in this instance, copies, they're always 20 cents. So instead of always having to put that in there, we just make the default the 20 cents. Um, it's got the description. Then in, a, in order to make it 
uh, part of the point of sale system, that second checkbox says can be sold. And that's the one you check to make it um, included in the point of sale side. The first checkbox can be manually invoiced is if you want to also have these debit types show on the patron account side. And we have our shown the exact same list of debit types show regardless of whether it's POS or you're in a patron account paying for something. There's a third checkbox called included in no issues charge. And I'm not exactly sure what that one does. So ours isn't checked. And then you choose your library. Uh, you would save this and then create as many debit types as you need. So we, like Mary mentioned, we're taking payments for three different entities. We actually have 30 debit types and we used a naming convention on these. So everything that's for the library starts with a BPL, everything that's for the friends starts with an FR and everything that's for the foundation starts with an FD. And this helps us kind of know what they're for and also with reports and sorting and that kind of thing. Um, once you create a debit type, um, you can't delete it, but you can um, archive it. I think that's true. And then if you, um, decide to bring it back, you, you can do that. Or maybe that's the payment types, I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, so uh, another thing we did was set up payment types. And this I think is optional as well. Um, for our purposes, we it was imperative that we know whether things were being paid for by cash, by check or by credit debit card. So this is an authorized value that you would go into its payment underscore type. And so we set those up, but I don't think you have to have these enabled. And now Mary is going to take us through actually making some sales. Okay, so after you have everything set up, um, you're ready to make sales. And just a little bit about our new setup. We have our um, cash drawer, not behind us, but actually under the front counter. And it doesn't just pop out. You have to either unlock it or push it, with, um, push it and it will open. The other thing that was really great is we got uh, credit card terminals on our computers in the front. So no more coming behind the desk to put in your pin. And then we purchased uh, receipt printers. At this point, we were using eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper and it was very slow and wasteful. So. so once you have the POS enabled, this it shows up on your screen and you click on point of sale. And then you can select the items that you want to add for your sale. And um, you just find the item and then click the add button. And then it will, the screen pops up, it says this sale. And you can see that here we're, we're buying or we're selling some copies and earbuds. And like Barbara said, if you have a cost already in there, it's a fixed cost, but you can change that if you need to. And you can also change the quantity. You just have to double click in the squares. And then once you've done, you know, added up all the things that you're going to sell, it will auto calculate how much you, how much the sale is. And then you can put in the amount tendered. And then my staff is so happy because it tells you how much change to give. For our purposes, it was important that we know that what type of um, payment it was. So we have um, that field is required. And then the cash registers, we just have one, but you can select which one you want if you have more than one. And then you hit confirm. And this is one of the things that I love best about it. It makes sure that you're not gonna make a mistake. So the amount collected is more than the outstanding charge. That's exactly what I want um, because it's gonna tell me how much change to make. And um, so you just confirm that. And then you have the option of either printing a receipt or emailing a receipt. And the receipt on the right is just the um, default um, template toolkit receipt, and it just has basic information. But if you want to get fancy, you can do that. So now um, this is making a sale with a patron account. And as long as you have enabled um, your debit types to be 
um, manually invoiced, the debit types will show up on the patron account. And so this is actually really helpful in our library. As long as the patron's account is in good standing, they can kind of run a tab up to a certain amount of money so you can keep track of what they want, you know, how much money they owe us. At some point, they do have to pay. But um, so you have the option of either just saving it or save and pay. And then this is just showing you, you've created a manual invoice and there's your save and save and pay. And then this is just, you know, a regular payment on a, a lost book. Um, you can see the book is lost, it's $15 and um, they're paying with a credit card. Just like normal. And then the lost book payment shows up on their um, transaction record. And you can see there's two lines. There's one that says it's been paid. And then um, the other line that you know showed what they were actually um, paying for. And what's really nice is it doesn't have to be um, on, well, I'm sorry, look at back up. So this is the POS transaction history. And it will show all of your sales, not just the ones that are on patron accounts or not just the regular uh, POS sales. It has everything in there. So even if you haven't selected um, debit types to be on a patron account, you're going to see that sale in the POS transaction history. Occasionally, we do have to give refunds, and it's pretty easy. All you do is you go to your transaction history, and then you're going to look for the transaction that you need to refund. And then you just click on the issue refund button and you put in the amount that you're going to return to patron. And then in our case, it's important that we refund the type of tender that they gave us. So um, in this case, it was cash. One thing I've learned that if somebody needs a partial refund, it's actually easier if you just refund the entire amount and then re-ring the transaction with the correct amount. It makes the accounting cleaner later. Hit confirm. And then um, you're ready to do the daily reconciliation. I'll take a little break here. Let me see my voice. <laughs> so in our library, we do our daily reconciliation the day after, the morning after. And this is our workflow. Um, we go to the POS and we look at the cash summary. And I'm going to go ahead for one screen. And this is the cash summary. Then I'll go back. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then um, you print the daily cash register reconciliation report. And then you're going to count your cash, your credit cards, and your checks and verify the amounts um, are the right amounts. And you fix mistakes if possible. And um, usually fixing mistakes requires either entering a transaction. Um, for example, because our credit card terminals aren't integrated, Sometimes people will take their credit card, but not actually fix it on the patron account, which drives me absolutely insane. Because <laughs> um, then I have to figure out what happens or who, who bought the book. And then I'll find out in a couple of weeks when they want to speak to the circulation supervisor and <laughs> chew her out. But anyway, so um, fixing mistakes is either that or, you know, somebody's counted wrong, they made a mistake. So once you've got everything fixed, you can um, click on the Reconcile Drawer link, and then it's going to um, prompt you to remove the right amount of cash, and then click Confirm to zero out the register. And then this is that cash summary. And this basically is the first screen you'll see when you're getting ready to reconcile. And it basically, you know, in this case, there should be, and our float is $100, so there should be $132.80. And then you had some credit card sales. And um, that's, what your, that's what your sale was for the, for the day. And then you just reconcile the drawer. And then it gives you that nice little confirmation so you don't mess up. Make sure you take that money out of the drawer and hit confirm. Unfortunately, we do make mistakes and they're just required to fix errors. And some of the um, errors that we make are we've chosen the wrong fund. So we meant to sell copies, but we accidentally sold tote bags. Or it was a library transaction, um, but we charged it to friends and foundation. That's kind of a big one to fix. 
put in the wrong amount, the wrong payment type, um, failure to enter the credit card transaction in Coha, we spoke about that earlier. And then sometimes we get really button happy and we hit that reconcile drawer button before we've actually counted the drawer. And invariably that will be the day that the cash is wrong. <laughs> but the biggest issue, the biggest problem, um, it's kind of my time warp problem. And you're gonna have to follow me on this one. So it's Tuesday, I've counted, I'm counting Monday's um, transactions. See that there's a mistake. I'm fixing it on Tuesday morning, okay? I do everything, I got it all balanced, I rerun my reports, we're good. But tomorrow, when I'm counting today, the fixes from yesterday are gonna be on tomorrow's. <laughs> so, um, did you follow that? It's very confusing. So tomorrow you have to remember to subtract out the fixes from yesterday. With that, here's Barbara. <laughs> So this is when you're on the cash summary page, um, when you're reconciling, all you really get is a link to click reconcile drawer. It's the pop-up that comes up and says, remove this amount and leave this amount. So as we were learning uh, POS, we were really confused in the very beginning. This was a, a, one of the stumbling blocks at the, at the very beginning of the process. So it says cash summary and the column is the last reconciliation you did, but we just kept expecting that clicking on that would show us detailed information about the sales in the drawer that we're about, we were about to reconcile, but that's not what it is. It's the previous. And so it took us a little bit of time to realize, oh, you know, cause we were trying to make this amount balance with the amount in the drawer and it was never going to balance because it was completely different. So that was a little bit of a stumbling block in the very beginning. So we would like to see an enhanced reconciliation modal. And I created a bug 37530 that would sort of combine the thought of what that last reconciliation link gives you except it wouldn't be the last reconciliation. It would be for the transactions in the drawer that you're about to reconcile. And then combine that with the uh, modal that you generally do get that says, please confirm you're moving X amount and leaving the other behind. And that just to us feels like more of a, a detailed process, more of a confirmation, um, better accuracy, and maybe it's just what we were kind of used to, I'm not sure. Um, and I'd love to talk to other people who use POS and you know get ideas on, does this seem like a good idea, a bad idea? Do you have a better idea? And then another thing that uh, with the date time problem that we tend to have, um, another idea we've got is um, added, adding an edit button to POS. So this is bug 36029, and this is a concept of maybe how this could potentially work. So the thought was, what if there was an edit button next to each of the transactions in the transaction history? Um, we believe this would need to be a controlled by permission because we wouldn't want everybody going in there and just willy nilly doing stuff. This would mostly, and for our thought, this would mostly be for the staff who is reconciling the drawer in the morning. So that would be some sort of how we would think of controlling it. So maybe you could hit an edit button and it would bring up um, a modal which looks, uh, or a page, whatever. Um, which looks very similar to the data that you generally see on the POS page when you're making a sale. But the thought would be you've hit the edit button and now you've brought up a transaction that actually has two parts to it. It had a sale for, I think the first one was copies and the second one was earbuds. And so maybe converting where it says item, generally that is filled in when you select what you're selling that is 
pre-populated over there. But maybe um, in the thought of editing, that could be converted to a dropdown so you could change it to, oops, I didn't mean to sell earbud earbuds. I meant it to be a flash drive or, or whatever it might be. And then the cost and the quantity would still be editable in case you needed to change those. So you would make those that fix and it would calculate if it needed to on the money. And then down in the bottom portion, um, some of these fields are similar to what you see on the page where you make the sale, but it would add um, a box for the date and it would specifically be allow being able to backdate it so that I'm making this uh, fix to this thing that was rung up wrong and I really want to uh, have it have the date of yesterday. And so that would help us with our reporting. And then if you needed to, you know, change the amount paid, the payment type, um, we have only got one register, but if you had multiple for whatever reason, so give some kind of ability to edit um, this transaction. So that's 36029. And this is the second one. I would really love to talk, talk to other people. You know, does this seem like a good idea? Do you have different ideas? Do you even handle it differently? And we don't know <laughs> about it. And maybe we can learn something. So now we're going to go into reports. And there is a built-in cash register report. Uh, it's in the reports module. You go to statistics wizards and then look for cash register. Uh, this is the screen that will come up. You can run it for a date range. Uh, you can do it for uh, all payments to the library. You can narrow it down to a specific kind. You can use all libraries or one, all registers or one, and then you will get um, data from that. And this is what it tends to look like. So, um, the first two lines are for, are for a transaction that was done in POS. So it shows you uh, the purchase, the POS sale is the $10. And then the first line is the actual um, payment, I guess, of that particular item. And then the third one down there is a lost item. So this is all fine and good, but what it didn't do for us is I don't know whether this was paid by cash, credit, or check. So that was going to be an issue for us. Um, I wasn't getting any subtotals by my different entities that I need. So I, I end up having to need to know at the end of the month that the friends had this much in sales, the foundation had this much, and the library had this much. So we realized pretty quickly the built-in report wasn't going to really um, work for us. So we were going to have to investigate what were, you know, was this even, were we going to be able to come up with something to where we were going to be able to use POS? So we sat down and we thought about the reports process. You know, what information did we need? How detailed did this information need to be? If you just need a total and it doesn't matter by cash credit, doesn't matter entity, then you're probably all set and good. But we needed specific subtotals and things for those different purposes. Um, how many reports do you need? We ended up with two. One is the daily reconciliation and one is a monthly. Um, and then how do you know you're getting accurate results? Well, um, that was a big, long uh, process. Uh, Mary and her staff were still keeping the Excel spreadsheet, manual spreadsheet, of uh, entering all the sales by the funds and everything uh, that they'd been doing with the cash register. So they kept keeping that one. And as I was going through the reporting process, trying to get things to total, you know, get the right things, get things to total and all that, I would think I'd got, gotten there and then she would show me her Excel report and it wouldn't be right. So it's like, okay, I'm missing something. So that was a, a big help actually that they were keeping that because I think I would have just thought I'm done and I've got my report done, but no, I hadn't. Um, who will you be sharing the reports with? If this is just internal, maybe, you know, it doesn't really matter what it looks like or whatever, but if you're going to be sharing it out to any kind of group, like your finance department, 
um, your friends or foundation group, your board for some reason, you might want to think about it's the report you've created. Is it going to be understood by the people you're sharing it with? And does it look professional? And so this was, I think, the most time consuming process of the whole project for us was coming up with reports that would work for us. And it was a matter of test and test and refine and test and then think you've gotten it right and having to test again. I didn't really know exactly where to start. So the first thing was looking at the account offsets. Um, so the account offsets table. So we have a report here that selects every field in the account offsets table, and you can run this one for a date range. When you get this data, it is lots of columns. It's about this wide, at least it feels that way. And I still, when I look at it, I feel overwhelmed. And it usually shows you a pair of transactions. Um, and anyway, it's, it's very confusing. But what it did do was allow me to see how the data was laid out and what the data, what the fields were called. So I kind of started there. So for our purposes, our reports are built on the account offsets table, the account lines table, and the cash registers table. And I didn't really know, I'm not good with joining in SQL. And I got out on Slack, I think, and I put out there, you know, we're trying to start using POS. And the very first thing I got was from Juliet Helterbrittle, and she's way back there. And she shared a report that they were using. So I ran that report and it didn't do exactly what we were going to need, but it certainly allowed me to start relating to what am I going to have to do to get the reports we need. And as we went along in the process, um, I also had help from Andrew and I had help from Brendan Lawler from Clams. And I don't know if I've seen him here. And then obviously Bywater. So I had lots of different um, input on how to create these different reports. So we have a daily cash report. This one is broken down. Um, well, it's, it provides a total for each fund or debit type, and then it is broken down by payment type. So by cash, credit, debit, or check. And this is what ours looks like. So that first three lines, those were all cash sales. We sold some of the same types of things down here in credit, um, but they're in the credit section. Then I've got a total for each section. The credit section actually had a refund. So we had to learn how to bring the refunds in. And then we had to learn how to like do math in SQL, which was not <laughs> something I knew how to do. And then we have a total sales and a total refunds. And I think I still haven't been able to figure out that total where I would get my grand, grand total. But anyway, um, so this is what they use every single day. They will print this out and hope that what's in the drawer as far as cash and credit card slips equals this stuff. Um, this report, we also... Um, in the date column, it was coming over with the timestamp, and we didn't really want that because it was meaningless. So we learned how to get rid of the timestamp. Um, all of the amounts were coming over left aligned. And so it's just weird, you know, money should be right aligned. It should all light up and everything. So we learned how to include some CSS in our report so that it would look pretty. We learned how to make our totals and things bold and we learned how to make a refund red and we had to fool with some margins because some funky things were happening with the margins and so we got all that in there. This is the first section of that report and I'm not really going to go through these in specifics. This report is actually 339 lines long and probably someone who knows SQL better than me could do it differently and it wouldn't be that overwhelming. But once I got 
like the cash sales working. It was like, okay, now I need to work on how would I get the cash refunds? And then now I need a total. And so I was building it by piece. And then once I got the whole cash section, I unioned that with, well, here's for checks and here's for credit debit. And so it, like I say, it, it could have maybe been less than that, but that worked for me. So, and so that is, let's see, this is the actual part that shows you the cash sales. And you can see that there's some CSS in there. And we've got the, oh, I didn't mention the uh, amounts sometimes would come across with either more than two decimals. I think some of them maybe came across with no decimal and we wanted it to look like real money. So we learned how to do that fancy little thing up there on the second line where it's got the amount and uh, it's limiting, limiting it to decimals so that it looks nice. And this part does the cash refunds. And this is the math I could not do. And I was trying to do it like all in one somehow. And apparently I had to do it where I calculated the sales and then added it to the refunds, which were already negative. So the math would come out. <laughs> and then we have a monthly report, which also provides a total for each fund. But this one is broken down by entity. So by library, friends and foundation. We run this at the end of the month. Um, this one is so, because we're acting as that pass through uh, for the friends and foundation, we need to submit this to our finance department so that they know what kind of, what amount of check they need to write back to those two entities. Uh, and it also helps those groups because they can use that report a little bit in their own accounting, so. And this is what that one looks like. So um, doesn't have payment type, it just has the debit types. And the first section is for the library, the second is the friends, and I didn't have a foundation on this one. And this is just the first part of that monthly report. And because they're so long and I knew I couldn't share the whole thing, I uh, have, both of them, the daily and the monthly, in my GitHub account, and you can take a look at them there if you want. So now we're going to go into just a little bit of CSS in jQuery. I think another thing that really tripped us up from the very beginning was some of the terminology. So POS out of the box uses terms like cash up and bankable. And our staff, our CERC staff is like, I don't know what that is. You know, I, I don't know what to do with that. So we were able to go in and give it some language that worked for us. So we're calling cash up either reconcile or reconciliation. And I couldn't end up changing this in every instance, but I do have it changed. And I think the ones that make a difference for us. And then we're calling bankable cash in drawer. And then we have the two others there where we changed. And I think... It's silly, but that was just like a big hurdle. And once we changed that, staff, I think, started to really relate to, to the whole thing. It was just kind of like, oh, now we can really start learning. And this is just showing that the first line is what the headers in the cash summary would be out of the box and what the change is after we applied the jQuery. And then also on the bottom there where you were doing your daily, what we would call a daily reconciliation was called record cash up. And they're like, what is that? So we renamed it reconcile drawer. And this is the jQuery we use to make those changes. And then this one, okay. This one was in the transaction history. Um, the there's the print receipt button and an issue refund button um, in this actions column on the right hand side. And staff was having trouble, all the buttons were styled the same. And so they're like, which button is it for the refund and what line am I on? They were just having a little bit of hard time, you know, focusing on where they needed to be. So we just did a little CSS, which is down there at the bottom, just to make that refund button 
uh, stand out. And when you're standing in front of customers and demanding their refund, you know, you, you want to be able to take care of it quickly. So, and then the debit type descriptions, um, this would be on the page where you're actually making your sales. So you've got your ad button over here on the right hand side. Um, we specifically created this naming convention for all of our things. And I wanted to sort by description, not by code. And this table is configurable in the table settings, but it is not sortable in the table settings. So we ended up coming up with some jQuery to make it sort by default by the second column. And one of the reasons, you know, we very specifically named our things VPL. We really wanted those things to be up at the top. We didn't want staff having to scroll through 30 <laughs> different debit types just to find the one thing they needed. So um, we've got that. And this is the jQuery we're using to make that sort. And everywhere in POS, the money is left aligned, which drives me nuts. I think it's all right aligned in the patron accounts, but in POS, it's left aligned and I couldn't handle it. So <laughs> there are multiple different places. This one is in where you're making a sale. Uh, and we use some CSS to um, change that up so that it would look like actual money and quantities. And this is what it looks like after it's so pretty. And then this one is in the transaction history. The money again was uh, left aligned. So we used some jQuery and it looks a lot nicer after having that applied. So now we're just gonna talk about uh, opportunities, wish list, bugs, whatever you wanna call it. So um, that first one, 36029, I alluded to earlier is the one where we would like the ability to be able to backdate or edit a transaction in POS. Um, the second one is bug 28599, which is the ability to void a purchase in point of sale, because you can void over on the patron side, but right now there's no void um, in POS. Um, 27785, POS needs a notes field, which would be great. Uh, you can generally do that on the patron side. It would really be nice to do it on a POS transaction, especially if maybe this is one of the transactions you're having to, it's a fix for something else that you messed up and maybe you would like to put some kind of note there. Um, 37530 is the ability to view and print previous days transactions prior to reconciling. That was our other sort of concept of maybe we could improve. Um, 27800 is make the ability to enter quantity more clear. And it's actually quantity and amount. And this is where you're selling something. So you're over here, you've got a, a debit type and it's copies and you've got an amount. It's not really clear that those cells are clickable. Uh, it does say, you know, click in the cell. It does say that, but it's not just really immediately um, obvious that those are editable. Um, and then two of them related to the transaction history, 28164. Basically, the sorting of the transaction history table doesn't work. Um, each of the columns has the up and down arrows that imply that you can sort it, but if you click those, it really does nothing. The only thing it does sort is if you had a transaction that was composed of like two or three or more uh, things within that set, it will sort um, in that, but otherwise the sorting is pretty, it's non-existent. And it would be nice to, to have sorting and it, it implies that it's sortable, but it doesn't. Uh, and then limiting the transaction history works, but it does not recalculate the grand total. That's 37566. So this one is in the transaction history. Maybe I want to go in there and I just want to see my sales for copies. And there's an input box and I can do that and I can limit it. So I'm showing my $15 in five transactions of copies, but my total sales for the day was you know, $213. And that's the total that is at the bottom. So if you wanted to print that off, you know, my boss comes to me, how, many, how much did we have in copy sales today or whatever? I might just print that off and think I'm giving her accurate information, which in fact, the total isn't really correct. 
and just a few more. <laughs> 37563 3, 3 is the refund modal and the point of sale should include ending zeros. This one already has uh, a patch and I signed off on it. What was happening is you would have like a $10 sale and then you went to go to do the refund. When you clicked on the refund button and you got the screen for that, it would just show you the amount 10 or maybe you had $2.40 and it would show on that screen 2.4. So that's all this is and I learned from the bug this wasn't just a POS issue it actually was occurring in the patron accounts on that side so this is supposed to address you know making it the actual amount um, everywhere so I, I hope that one will move through quickly um, 28539 is allow for negative payments in point of sale so I guess that would be like a credit uh, 36403 is add the ability to set the default sort order for items, and that was the one where I said the table couldn't really be configured. Um, 28265 was uh, the add the option to include, include and calculate sales tax. We don't have to worry about sales tax, but I can imagine if you do, this would be really great so that you didn't have to calculate this on the side. It, just, it would just be built in. And then the last one I truly didn't understand until I looked at it. This is 28406, and its point of sale doesn't register a sale when the total amount is zero. And I thought, well, why would it? But the use case is maybe you have free stuff like pencils, and you just hand those out. But you want a tracking mechanism, and so you want to run those through POS. And I think most modern POS systems have like an inventory aspect to them. So this could let you see, well, how many pencils did I hand out? And, you know, what's my inventory? When should I order more pencils to give out? So once that was explained, uh, that one made sense. So that is basically our POS journey. Uh, it is work. We've been using it since about August last year. So really right at about a year. And it's really doing most of what we need. It's not perfect. Um, but we're very happy with it, and we'd love to see improvements to it as well. And uh, that's that's it. It's free. And it's free. So I put our contact information there, and like I said, I'd love to talk to anybody else who has ideas about point of sale. And are there any questions? There are a couple of online questions. So um, one of them, uh, Carolyn already answered, it was about the tax element. So that's three times today, Carolyn from Librio has answered the question <laughs> online. So thank you very much. Um, then we had a question from Tammy Euler. What systems are you using to process credit card payments? <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> um, it's a, it's um, it's what the city tells yes. us to use. It's what well, the city yeah. tells them to use. Okay, so they're not a hundred percent sure. No, about. we're using it's um, it's city, it's Citibank. C Citibank. Yeah. yeah. Citibank. Um, we use we use Square for special events, and our friends use Clover, and our foundation uses PayPal. Wow. Yes. <laughs> okay. Then the follow-up question online to that was, um, is, are these POS systems, uh, is the POS system in Koha PCI compliant? And I think that has to do with the credit card security. Yes. Um, so, and they're nodding their heads. Yes. So. Yes. Thank you. Everything that happens, Stays credit card transaction is outside. Of Google, yes, so it doesn't do anything with yeah. PCI. Yeah, it's outside. I just wanted to make sure we were like four months ahead of you guys doing the POS. And so I actually found a blog post on my water 
from Andrew that explained how to do the report, and that's what I stole, and then I did <laughs> like work for me. So I put a ticket into Bywater and they fixed it because we needed to include the manager, the person who actually did the transaction. Mm -hmm. And so we had to link the borrower's table to our report mm -hmm. so that we could see that. And it was a little confusing because I think we linked the borrower's table twice and I didn't understand how to do that. That's my first experience linking a table more than once in a report. And so that was a learning curve and it's worked really well for us. We don't need quite as much detail as mm -hmm. you guys do. Mm -hmm. So um, our business office can do a little bit more explaining and giving it to the city. Um, one of the things that we run across is that one that you mentioned, the negative amounts in uh, there. We would really like that because we give refunds for something that's outside of the system because we have our um, printing is done mm -hmm. with their kiosk. And if they ever have a mess up and they want a refund for that, we basically do a transaction called refunds, and then we just have to tell the city that's not a positive, it's actually a negative. Yeah. Just pretend that it's a negative. Right. <laughs> so if we could just put it in as a negative, it would be way right. better yeah. for our paperwork. But that's just our way of doing it, and it would be nice if that bug had some traction. <laughs> Uh, I have a question. It's not really a co-ism, but kind of like a processism. Who's doing the reporting? So that if you have something that you needed to fix from yesterday and you have that whole kerfluffle, how does the person who's doing the deposit that morning know that something was messed up yesterday? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, the totals won't match. Or I get a phone call. Oh, okay. <laughs> so are you the only one who's... No, all of our CERC staff does it. And then okay. there's one other manager that... Um, helps us out, but generally we just keep it in the CERC department. Cool. So. Okay. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've been going through the, the point of sale stuff ever since it came out. We've, we've loved the point of sale. I know that. We've had to work with some libraries that have since moved on from that because they needed something a little bit more robust. But uh, one of the things that we're running into and we're having a conversation with I want right now is whether or not we can track, how we can appropriately track in the point of sale uh, when we receive money for an item that has to go to another library. So um, that, that's an element that still mm -hmm. needs to be, we either need to figure out how we can do it with how COHA works now, or uh, we, we need to determine whether or not we need an enhancement for that. Because what basically what happens is, uh, you know, we want to help the patron move along and they come in, mm -hmm. they have a block on their account because they have an item that's lost, they pay for it, they want... They want to pay for it, and our mode of operation before was, well, you have to deal with the owning library in order to resolve that, and so we're basically turning it away, and our philosophy is that we want to uh, allow patrons to move on and, you know, come in with for what they, they came in for and, and get that, and so we have since started allowing patrons to pay for other libraries' things at, at that library. The problem that we, we have, there's two things that happen. First of all, when we do a cash up, it doesn't match because what's in the cash box, we don't put other library stuff in our cash box because it's going to go to another library and we don't want to go through the city to process that. So um, we end up having that mismatch on, on transactions like that. The other thing is they pay for it and so they're all good at our library and can move on and and check things out or whatever but the owning library is going where are those funds we have no way of showing that oh those funds are going to be on their way to that library and so there's no there's no transitional status on those items you know as far as the state the patron is concerned they've fulfilled their requirement and done everything they, they can 
but there's no status within that transaction to show that there's another step in the process, which is those funds are making their way to the online library. So those are a couple of things that we're working on uh, trying to figure out. One thing which we didn't cover because it was kind of so hard to explain is we can make a same day refund, but if we make a refund after the fact, that refund has to go to finance. So those were appearing in our report. So I created a payment type, I think, called finance refund. And then I excluded those from the reports so that it wouldn't affect the total. And I don't know if that would be helpful in any way in your first part, your first issue. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I couldn't remember exactly how I did it, so <laughs> I didn't include it. The other comment I wanted to make was your um, bug 36029, I think, about wanting to be able to edit uh, transactions. And I know that, well, okay. In general, I wouldn't think that that's such an issue, but I think that um, my, my history with people some folks in our consortium that have um, uh, audits would look at something like that and go, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> um, I'm wondering if it would be better instead of being able to edit something to add another transaction line, yay. Yeah, possibly. And, and, and you know, make an adjustment on that line with notes. Yes. Notes are great, mm -hmm. um, but that rather than edit something because then I can see all sorts of wonky things going on. And that's could just change it. Yeah, that's very possible. And I know we were coming from a cash register of the beast we had that we showed you a picture of. And I don't know how those edits were made, but Mary could go in there and make those changes. And so we were trying to get to something that was similar to that. And I know also it might be like, well, why don't you just reconcile at night? Well, I think our staff would kill us. Yeah. So it just happens in the morning. So we can't get past that one. It's just not going to be on the same day. Um, I was thinking the same thing, Christopher, when you talked about the edits. I was visualizing what we have in acquisitions where you can kind of add mm -hmm. positive or mm -hmm. negative adjustment mm -hmm. to your point of sale mm -hmm. versus with the right date versus that date. Yeah instead of the edit thing, but I think it's a valid point you're making. Yeah. It's just a matter of what works for everybody. And I right. think the edit is kind of kind of could be could be bad. Be like, what was it before? <laughs> oh, and no issue charge. Sorry. You yeah. brought up no issue charge. So if you are when you were creating your debit type and it says include in no issue charge, that's a system preference that says that a patron has like how much they can accrue on their bill before okay. they get blocked. Okay. So will this debit okay. be included in your no issue charge max? Okay, cool. This is kind of goofy, but the way we fixed the date being on the wrong day when I worked at a golf course. So in a completely different venue. But we would literally change the time on the computer. I don't know about <laughs> we would change the time and date on the computer to be yesterday's date, fix what we needed to fix, rerun the report. And <laughs> I'm sure the auditors would Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that yeah. was still legal. This is a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.